everybody. It's Chris. It's We Are Live special one-on-one today with showrunner, producer, writer extraordinaire, Dara Resnick. Dara, thank you so much for jumping on. Hope you're happy, safe, healthy. I can uh, I can tell you're super pumped to be here as well during all this, uh, <laughs> the madness that's happening. How are you? Happy to be here. I'm good. I'm washing my hands a lot. Good. Same here. <laughs> I'm just like, I, it's just... I, uh, I'm, I've got the masks. I've got several different motifs that I kind of work with. Um, I am larger than a lot of people. So I'm like, I'm like six, three. So, and like you get in with these people in these grocery stores and nobody, I don't know if it's, a, <laughs> if like, if I just take up too much space or what, but it's, uh, well, your arm, if you're six, foot three, then all you have to do is spread your arms out just do that. from end to end. And in theory, the distance of your fingers would like right. tell you. So should I chirp at him a little bit? Be like, Hey, well, yeah. fingertips. This is it. Six feet. <laughs> I could deal with that. I don't know. <sighs> We've got plenty to get into, uh, with your series and your career as well. But, uh, this is super interesting. I know this has to affect you. I work with some, some great folks in Los Angeles that are, Hold up. I deal with a lot of people in the uh, stand-up comedy world that are losing their mind right now. Um, as somebody who is in a writer's room, we were just talking about this a bit ago, but what is this, I guess, has this helped? Is there anything positive that's coming from this, uh, this quarantine oh, yeah. issue? Yeah. Oh, yeah. I mean, I actually think it's, there's a lot that's coming out of it that's great. I mean, I, I like to tell people like, God, if there weren't tens of thousands of people dying outside. This would be like a really beautiful time to see what happens with creativity and, uh, you know, to see what comes out of this. Like I, we've had a lot of time to, to think about, for example, uh, what I want my next show to be. I started on an, in a new room. Um, that's been pretty incredible. I have been writing a lot. I've had a lot of time for introspection, time to, after running a show for two years, you know, I finally have time to spend with my kid. Like there's a, there's a lot that's really sort of wonderful about this. Yeah. Um, and I don't, I don't know, stand-up comedians are different than writers. Like, you know, we're kind of, we're introverted. We, we like, we like our time alone and we like, our, our moments of peace and quiet. So this has actually been okay, except for, you know, everyone is dying. Yeah, that's the, that is the <laughs> thing. Cause I even hesitate too, just in the business that we're in, we're, we're busy. It's weird. Like, it's strange yeah. to say, like, it's, 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 it is what it is. And you have other people that are dealing with everything, yeah. but someone that's in a creative set and I'd be uh, remiss not to mention home before dark. You guys can stream that right now. Uh, Apple TV coming at you hard. They've got the free subscriptions for uh, people. I'm seeing all yeah. kinds of original content and to be part of that, uh, it has to be super important to you. I'm sure you pulled, I mean, it, it your career leading up to it, obviously you earned every bit of being in that room, getting that opportunity, but also I'm sure you've used that as a major learning position, I assume, right? Oh yeah. I mean, it's, I definitely, I felt very ready for it. Um, and I, yes, also it was an incredible learning opportunity. I mean, I, I like to say, and I hope that I'm, you know, not just being self-inflated. I like to say that was my first show because you know, you look back and you go like, oh God, I would have done this differently and that differently. But um, I'm still, I'm really proud of it. And the only bright spot really in, in it coming out during the pandemic is that people are locked in their houses and families are locked in their houses and need something to watch together. And the number of tweets and messages that I've gotten from around the globe where people are literally in quarantine in Israel and Poland and Russia and everywhere around America, and they're watching this show together. Um, it's pretty incredible. And also, I would just like quick, quick Apple TV plug: you don't have to have an Apple TV to watch the show or to download Apple TV. Great, and I, I highly suggest people check that out. Uh, again, Home for Dark, and then there's a ton of other great programming as well. And you'll you'll actually double take when you see the uh, the the lineups of people in there. Uh, curious, Home Before Dark. You did have a you've had a busy career over the last yeah. few years. Um, can you take us from concept to signing on the dotted line to say, okay, this is a show. Here we go. This is it. Yeah. So um, I 
I was married to my writing partner for many years, and my first solo gig after our divorce was Jane the Virgin. And right around then, I became friends with Joy Gorman Weddles. Our daughters were best friends in preschool, and we had these two incredibly spirited daughters, and we would talk long nights over wine about the kind of program we wanted to make. And then she went off and made 13 Reasons Why, which I thought was phenomenal television. And um, I then was on Shooter, and then right as I Love Dick was kind of wrapping up, um, and I was really coming into my, because that was the first all-female television staff in basically the history of television. How crazy, real, real quick, how, how wild is that to even say that? Like that's It's crazy. It's completely insane when you think about it. Of course, mm -hmm. Jill, Jill, when we started, identified female, so I can say, so I, I could also say it was the first female and non-binary stuff. But yeah, I mean, it's completely insane. And it was beautiful. Like the number of shows that have had only men on staff and then the number of times we got asked, are you sure you don't want to have a man in that room is completely insane to me. But um, it was pretty incredible. It was the, what I realized when I was sitting at the production meeting for the first and the production meeting for anybody who doesn't know is it's the first time that you're sort of sitting down with all the heads of departments um, and the script and the AD is going through scene by scene and this is all the stuff you're going to need. And the people who sit at the head of the table are the EPs, um, often the DP, the director, um, the writer of record. And I am sitting at the head of the table next to Kim Pierce and Jill Soloway and Sarah Gubbins and Heidi Schreck, who has since been nominated for a Tony for what the Constitution means to me. Um, I think I already said Kim Pierce and uh, Andrea Arnold. And, and I realize there are no men here telling us what to do like i'm so i'm so used to being told what to do by like the you know the six foot three white guy who walks into the room so so um i you I know was, what I, it's so weird that you know exactly what i do when i walk in a room yeah, too like you walk into a room and you tell people what to do that that's right what men do <laughs> what they're made for yes so um so i was coming out of that and joy had gotten the rights to this little girl's story. Um, and it was Hildy Lysiak's story. She was uh, eight years old when she scooped a local paper of a murder on her street. Her dad had been a big daily news reporter who'd gotten completely disillusioned with the business. Uh, he moved the entire family from New York to not far away from where he'd grown up in Pennsylvania. And Hildy started riding her bike around town and very quickly started a newspaper and scooped a murder, as you do as an eight-year-old. Typical. And Typical. I mean, I was just like that. And I was, I'm, let's be clear, I'm Jewish. I wasn't allowed to leave my apartment alone. But in any <laughs> case, um, Joy and I started talking about what this show could be. And she had another friend of ours involved, Dana Fox. And she asked if I wouldn't mind collaborating on it. And she asked Dana if she wouldn't mind. And the three of us got together. And, uh, you know, what was weird was, and you asked about the dotted line, that was in the, the spring of 2017 right after the election and you know the, the term fake news was going viral and, and that it just made the show seem so incredibly current that you know here was a girl saying believe girls believe women um this is what the truth is this is what real news is and obviously we couldn't have known that it would be even more current now uh but but we sold it and we wrote to Paramount TV Studios and we wrote the pilot and then there was like a moment in time where it wasn't really quite getting made and they they sort of wanted us to package it which is when you attach people and the the opportunity for me to hop on Daredevil came up and I'm a giant nerd and I love genre and I'd never gotten to be on a Marvel show and I said yes and I kind of thought I might be saying goodbye to the project but I was super lucky because while I was in New York producing giant Daredevil episodes and like living my dream, Joy Gorman was fulfilling the other part of my dream and attaching John Chu to the project. And by the time I was done with Daredevil, we basically had a project with a director who little did we know had directed a movie that was about to make, you know, more money, more profit for a studio than any movie like that in re recent memory. And it, it made between Hildy's name, the pilot that we had written and John, um, it really was just such a great package for Apple. We got so lucky they uh, they gave us the series order in the room. That's that's not normal for anybody. That's uh, no. well, that's not normal at all. As you hear this, as <laughs> as you're into a career with credits, 
you're working on what many people would be like, okay, uh, Daredevil, let's take, <laughs> let's take the yeah. results out of what it looked like. It could have been like, well, easy street. Here we go. Marvel money. It's all, it's all coasting from here. You, yeah. <laughs> that, that gets canceled. And then you've got this <laughs> other project. So I guess just yeah. the, the insanity of the world that you've made your life in always just mesmerizes yeah. me. And I'll hear oh, in God. this. Oh, sorry, that's my. Oh, you're fine. All right. Hopefully that'll stop. Okay. Oh, it's totally fine. No, it just the insanity <laughs> of it. And then you hear of people selling a pilot, actually cashing out, making, you know, what do they spend on pilots? A couple million dollars. And then they don't even go to TV. That I know. It's so wild for that to happen. So I guess my question would be just as. Daredevil, whether we like it or not, was probably a nice stepping stone for you to to, <laughs> to home before. And by the way, I hopped off it before I knew it wasn't going to be renewed. Look at you! That's even. I ho I hopped off to do the show, and my friends, a bunch of my friends, Sam Ernst, Ernst and uh, and Jim, and a mm -hmm. bunch of those guys, all stayed. Yeah. They started breaking a fourth season, and then found out that they were canceled. So I mean, I really do feel like I dodged kind of a bullet. There. Right. It was really incredible luck. Sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt no, your question. It's no, I appreciate that. And I, I didn't, I didn't, I wasn't even aware of that. So that's, that's fantastic to know <laughs> that. It actually makes it even more of a, of a crazy happenstance that it went forward like that. But I guess with this, I mean, not to be looking too forward ahead, but what's the stepping stone from the position you have <laughs> with, with Apple TV, with, with this entire series? Like, what uh, do you do now? Yeah, I mean, well, to a degree, yeah. I mean, yeah. there's just so many different options, and that's good and bad, I think. But do you have a specific goal? I mean, you said you just, you were you're working on some writing. What uh, what's what's in the hopper? What's next? I mean, that's a really one of the things I always feel sad about is, um, you know, when you see like a, like a very young Oscar winner. I, mm. I weirdly always feel incredibly sad. Because I think, oh my God, you you're, you know, either nine or or twenty, and you won an Oscar. Like, what do you do with that now? Like, where do you go? Um, you know, I, I wish I could say that this show has just, like, I bought. That's it. I have my ticket now, and I can do whatever I want to do. Um, that's not really true. I think it helps a lot. Yeah. It's it's definitely been incredibly helpful in setting things up. Um, I set up something at Amazon with a playwright. Um, based on uh, a podcast called The Horror of Dolores Roach. It's with uh, Blumhouse. It's a genre, which I'm really excited about because, I love, as I said, I love genre. Um, Isn't this and, wild? Like, I, I'm so sorry. This is I've been listening to podcasts since, I'll just say, 2009, and this is not uncommon whatsoever now for podcasts to get, I mean, do we call it getting optioned? Like, what is that? It's yeah. so, it's, it's yeah. wild to see that. And it's exciting too, because it's one more avenue for creators to find people like you. I totally agree. And I think, you know, I'm working with this, this guy, who, this guy, Aaron Mark, who's incredible. And my, like, I feel like he's my brother from another mother and he's, uh, you know, was a playwright for many years and, and I, he has segued so easily into television writing. And I think that that's because he had the experience of creating the podcast first, which in so many ways has the same structure as a television show. It's episodic, you know, it has a bingeable quality to it. Like, I, I mean, I've been telling, I teach at USC on the side. And, and one of the things I always tell my students is, you know, when I was graduating back in the old days of, you know, 2003, <laughs> you know, it wasn't, it, we didn't have a camera in our phone. We didn't have the ability to do a podcast. We, there were Whenever there, I have all these students who are graduating right now in the middle of a pandemic and they're freaking out. And I'm like, you still have it better than we had it graduating into five networks and like two cable outlets. And the number of jobs out there is astounding. A number of ways that you can create is exponential. And you have in that too, and I'm sure you've shared a similar thought with your students, um, just being in the podcasting production world, we do like some events and stuff too, but being in this world, um, it's really interesting to see how it's flexed too, because the biggest names in everything are now either doing podcasting or they're just really focusing on their Instagram account or something. So the oh, barrier, right. the barrier to entry, even to connecting with those people is, is much lower than it would have been when you would have had to write a letter, 
get approved and then maybe camp outside of somebody's office, right? Like totally. that's not that long ago. <laughs> totally. Yeah. It, you said you can edit this, right? I got to get my water. I'll be right back. Please go ahead. <laughs> I do not have COVID. I just have allergies. Oh, sorry. I just tweeted that out. Is that bad? God, isn't that the worst? I know. And I keep having to explain to people, I swear I'm not dying. I just have an allergic cough. We, we are allowed to still <laughs> get sick a little bit. Uh, okay. What are we talking about? Podcasts. Yes. Podcast creating. Buried entry. Yeah. Yeah. There it is. Uh, yeah. You good? Yeah, I'm good. Okay, cool. Uh, no, I just find it to be very interesting that the uh, the creative assets are out there. And to a degree, I'm not saying you don't have to earn and, and just grind through, but to a degree, the opportunities are uh, set lower than maybe they were 20 years ago. Totally. I yeah. think, uh, I, I mean, I would love to have been graduating now and not then. I, and, I'm, and you're seeing that too. There's a lot of eyeballs out there. And I'm not saying, like, listen... If you go out and TikTok yourself, you're not. Most of you aren't going to be great. Somebody might be. Somebody might catch on though, and have at you, least it's there. Have you been watching this girl? There's this amazing actress named Mary Neely, and her TikToks have gone viral. She's been reenacting her favorite musicals and like literally just filming like herself as Belle and then herself as the Beast and then herself as all the characters in Les Mis, dressed fully dressed up, fully acting. She's going to get so many roles after this just because she decided to have some fun in her house in quarantine. I See, that's exactly what I'm talking about. I'm glad that you backed me up with such a great example there because totally. it's there. And if you if you want to, I mean, uh, listen, I get it. If you're depressed, if you're dealing with uh, financial issues, if you're – this is a horrible time. We, we're acknowledging that. But totally. it's also a time that maybe you can tap into something creative – or tackle some projects uh, that you never would have, so. Well, I think it's one of the things that's so beautiful about what it is we do. I mean, I think Lin-Manuel Miranda says it best when he said, you can write your way out. And every single time I've hit a major crossroads in my life, you know, having my, my I was, like I said, I was married to my writing partner for many years and we broke up, I had to write a spec. You know, when I wanted to switch genres, I had to write another spec. When I, when we, when we as a team wanted to switch from features into television, we had to write a spec. Like, you know, it, yes, it's terrible out there, but let that feed the art. Let that be your engine towards writing yourself into a better life and a better position. Well said. And I'm curious too, within the business, um, so showrunner, creator, writer, producer, in what capacity, I guess, <laughs> in all the jobs that you've held, and I'm sure you've literally held every single one on a, <laughs> on, a, a on a line, I, I, I am curious which allows for either the most uh, flexibility. And when I mean flexibility, I mean you're able to have input on a show in many different areas and which is maybe you are – only supposed to write one page for one character if you're a certain type of writer. That's just something I'm curious about uh, from the outside looking in. I don't think I need you to repeat the question because I think I don't quite. It's get a it. little. It's a little. So having had so many, yes, I've different had all these different roles, jobs. Yeah. You have. Yeah. So of those roles in a higher level, in a more yeah. uh, in your higher level roles, I guess which role has allowed you to be more involved with the project oh. as a whole as compared oh. to being a specialist and in part of, uh, I guess, just yeah. show creation. Um, I mean, obviously, showrunner really, one of, one of the reasons I segued into television, my colleague Dana Fox actually said it really well many years ago before we were even working together. She has had a career in features and eventually also was doing some television. And she said, I was tired of getting kicked off right when things were getting interesting. Mm. And I think that that was very much how we felt. We, you know, had started and we had done a little bit of TV, a little features, then a little TV. Then we took five years off in features. Um, nothing was getting made. It felt like we were getting sort of ostracized to an extent in, in the process. 
um, the process of making things. And we went back into TV and we realized, you know, that's a place where the writer actually gets to keep creative control. And there's no more. I mean, I literally was so cute. I got to do a Zoom uh, interview with a bunch of moms in New York and their kids who have all watched the show together. That's amazing. And, and the kids asked what a showrunner does, which was really sweet. And, um, and I said, a showrunner is the being a showrunner is the best job a person can have because you get to write everything and then you get to pick the all the people who make the sets and the costumes and you get to pick the actors and you get to tell them what you think and you get to collaborate with all these incredibly creative people. Um, you know, and it, that really is a dream come true. I mean, there yeah. have been moments in the last couple of years I mean, frankly, even I remember as far back as Daredevil, I remember shooting on a New York street that I had, you know, probably like had a beer on a stoop with some friends in 1994. And like now I was overseeing a multi-million dollar set piece production <laughs> on the same street at two o'clock in the morning and, you know, with rain bars and stunts and vehicles. And, and I just thought like, like if you told 17 year old me or 16 year old me that this would be my life, I'm going to cry. Like, yeah. I, I would have said, where do I sign? Right. What do I, who's, what, which baby do I have to sell you? Like, <laughs> um, and I felt like this, this whole last couple of years, we are so, it's, I'm so fortunate. And any of us who get to create for a living are so fortunate to get to do what we do. It's never lost on me. Anytime I give my ID, to the guard at like the Warner Brothers gate or the Paramount gate. Yeah. And there's a drive on pass with my name on it. And I get to drive and park underneath the water tower. It, it, there's something magical about that every time. It's, uh, <laughs> and the, and the just viewing capacity that I've popped into Comedy Central for a taping and CBS, like, what is that, Radford uh, in uh, yeah. Studio yeah, City? Yeah. In the brief times I've even been, I, I you feel just that hint of like, all right, <laughs> like here yeah, we are. Like I've made there's, it. There's I'm going. Here, man. Oh man, I can't imagine. Totally. Yeah, yeah. Mine was definitely spectator, but at the time it just you do. You, there's that gravity to it, and you see, wow, this person's making this happen. All of that. So that's super interesting to me, and I love the uh, emotional connection that you have to that because I think sometimes uh, it's easy to lose that probably and become jaded. It's easy because it's, look, the fact of the matter is it's counterbalanced by it being, being a brutal business. And mm. there are some people that aren't nice and there are some people who will do horrible things to you. And you mostly just have to ignore those people and keep the really good people close to you. And remember that at, at its core, I mean, one of the things that I love, there was this moment the the food fight scene in the show was actually day one of shooting, believe it or not. So poor John Chu really had it had a lot on his <laughs> plate. Yeah. No pun intended. Sure. And and the food fight scene ends and they and we still had a couple of pickups we had to get, including the principal um the principal had to step in mashed potatoes in order for Hildy to see that clue. And uh, they had cleaned up all the mashed potatoes. So suddenly we're like, oh crap, we have no mashed potatoes for this for this tiny stupid shot that we didn't get because we were too busy trying to do the food fight. And so John Chu and I, who shot our films at USC, by the way, within like six months of each other and used the same DP then that we used on Home Before Dark. So like, literally it was the three of us who known each other as 22 year olds are now scraping up tiny pieces of mashed potato <laughs> and trying to get enough to make a ball that a foot could step in. And I thought to myself, like, this is actually beautiful. We're on this multi-million dollar Apple production and we're still making, we're still, it's still guerrilla filmmaking. Yes. No, that's, that's a great way to put And And what better, what a lesson to pass down to those young, younger actors. What a, and maybe they won't realize it now, or even your, even children or, or people that are wanting to get into the business to leave the attitude at the door. Listen, yeah. you're still gonna you're gonna be at the Break top of your game. Potatoes. You're gonna be <laughs> you're gonna be collecting mashed potatoes, so the studio okay. doesn't call you and be like, "Why are we over budget? Why didn't like, we get the thing? Oh well, I was too good to pick up mashed potatoes. Exactly. <laughs> That's such a great mindset. <laughs> I, I I am curious as well. Um, I guess working uh, with Apple as I mean. Is it just, and I'm not asking for anything disparaging or anything like that, but is it just the same as, I mean, is it just a different name at the top? I mean, is this? Yeah, 
Pretty much. I mean, yeah. you know, just like when you work for different networks, they're all looking for different. Just when I was working for networks, you know, Fox was looking for something slightly different than what ABC is looking for. Apple's brand is slightly different than Amazon's brand. Sure. You know, so, but in terms of working for them, it was the same as anywhere else right. I've been, you know, there were, uh, I, I would actually even maybe say they were even a little bit more generous than anywhere else I'd been so far in terms Still of, new. you know, <laughs> yeah. I mean, I just think that they really, they really wanted to stand by what they had told us, which is that they were going to be supportive of our vision. Um, and, and I, I will say that they, they truly were. No, so. That's that's fantastic to hear, and I'm sure everybody can enjoy uh, all of the great programming. And again, too, free, and you don't have to have Apple TV to uh, to watch. Yeah, episodes, you can so. download it onto your Roku, your Fire, whatever. Um, That's awesome. And I, you know, I've I've loved a lot of things on there. In fact, related to what we were just talking about, one of the things I discovered on there was the show Visible. Have you seen, seen this? No, I've, I've only watched it's, one series on it, and, I'll, and we can talk about it in a second. But well, I will totally talk about any of their series because I've I'm really been impressed with, with the quality of their programming. They have this great documentary series called Visible, which is about the history of essentially gayness and gay characters and gay personalities in television. And it's just incredibly beautifully done. And it really made me cry almost every episode. And one of the things that it reminded me of every time I watched it was this is a medium that makes a difference. This is a medium that nudges the needle in a progressive direction. Um, I like the competition know. aspect too. Like, oh, you make good documentaries? Cool. We do too. Right. We'll make good documentaries <laughs> too. Totally. We're going to no. out documentary each other. Then there's <laughs> the sharks and the jets, yes. the cameras. I love that. <laughs> no, I, I think that means a lot too. Again, um, you wouldn't have seen that not that long ago. Documentaries were stuff your social studies teacher made you watch. You know, that's yep. it wasn't the entertainment. No, I. And now uh, we all have the Tiger King. Oh my god! <laughs> oh my gosh! I, I have Thank so god. much to say about that. I don't. We, I do too. Let's. All right. Let's, let's get to Tiger King watch after. Visible. Yes. Not the Tiger King. <laughs> Well, and as we were talking about it, um, and I'm sure, I feel like you probably have to, t I wasn't even going to bring it up, but The Morning Show, how great. Oh my I gosh. Loved I loved it. I really yeah, enjoyed I, that. I, I, I have to say, I, I watched it like a little bit, like I, I turned it on and was like, you know, yeah. like, let's see. Um, I thought Jennifer Aniston did, the, it was the best acting she's done in her whole life. Right. Um, Steve Carell's amazing. Uh, I think that they do post meet the post Me Too movement um, real justice in the way that it portrays what that is like for the people around, you know, someone who makes that kind of giant mistake. Sure. Um, I or, felt or, I felt yeah, like it ahead. made you think a ton too. Like I don't yeah. and because like obviously you're going to have biases, but I felt like it one million percent made everyone stop and go. Ooh, am I mad yeah. at that person, or totally. is that their fault? Like I felt that like there was a lot of that. That scene with Steve Carell and Martin Short is like one of the best. It's probably like the best post Me Too movement scene I've seen. And it, it was what a taste. I, I say tasteful, like what a crazy scene, but what a great way to say, hey, there are variances in this as well, and they yeah. addressed it. It was so. Uh, I, yeah, I was, it was beautifully I was done. I was impressed. Um, Home Before Dark, though. People need to watch that um, over yeah. Tiger King. Did you watch all of Tiger King? I, you know what? I actually did drop off because I found, I couldn't find someone to like. Yeah. I'm one of those people that really has a hard time if there's somebody that I can't glom onto as like, oh, I'm rooting for, even if I don't like you. I don't have to like you. I just have to mm -hmm. be rooting for you. I, I just, there was no one to root for. I didn't know who I was. The Tigers, I guess. I guess, but tigers are pretty. I mean, they'll eat you. I mean, I mean, they're, they're not. They're, you know, they're cute. They can be cute. Of they're course, kind of, of course. I'm not. I'm not going to put my arm in one of their mouths, like like that poor human that did that. Mm, that was bad. Um, but but yeah, no, I know. Everyone really loves that show. I just I couldn't wrap my mind around it. <laughs> I don't know if love. I think people are just like it's like you see a family at. Um, at Walmart that maybe you shouldn't be laughing at, but you right. know, it and then, happens. And then there they are at Walmart. And that's what happens. Yeah. Um, so, okay. So we've covered 
projects you're working on, you're working through the pandemic. Uh, <laughs> I guess for anyone that's wanting to, to jump in, what do you tell your students um, in regards to career paths? And I'm sure you deal with people that yeah. think they're going to be the next Spielberg to the people that think they're going to be the next uh, Jennifer Aniston or something like that. Just USC, right. if you walk around that campus, uh, it's uh, like you're just like, look at all these amazingly talented, wonderful people walking around here. It, it's a little yeah. daunting not being from there. And you just start looking around like, how are all of these people not just stars everywhere? That's every large college, I guess. But, <laughs> <laughs> but I guess uh, common advice that you would drop to worthy students we'll say that yeah i mean i give i mean i tell my students that once they're my students you know in my class they're my students for life and i'll i'll talk to them and counsel them whenever they need it um the the advice that i give every single person is that you are your own factory consider yourself your own business top down so if what you want is to be a director go direct if you what you want is to be a writer go write if what you want to do is be an actor go act and if that means that you have to even as an actor if it means you have to find a writer to help you create material where you can either do stand up or put on a small one woman show um that's what you have to do and i i don't I do believe that the amount of time that it takes to be successful can vary greatly. I've seen people, I graduated with this amazing woman, Dana Greenblatt, who's a writer on SWAT now. Um, I've heard that no, name. No, SEAL Team. Sorry, SEAL Team. She's, sure. been, she's been writing for a long time. Um, and she and I, she graduated one year ahead of me but she had less luck than me and it took until she was on the show Nashville before suddenly she was ascending the ranks and now, you know, she does great. She's probably even maybe written more episodes of television than me at this point. Um, but I got luckier and sold my thesis script right out of film school and that that's luck. On the other hand, the thing that Dana did right, which I think is a great example, is she just kept doing it. She just kept trying. She didn't allow the fact that the luck part hadn't found her to stop her from doing her job. Um, and I do believe that that luck piece is opportunity meeting preparation. And the preparation is the thing that you can control. Great way to put it. And if you look no further than, and I, I, St. Louis is an easy one because I'm, you know, I'm close to it, but I could name four actors from St. Louis that all became household names and with after grinding it out for a long time right and you just think in forefront being john ham i mean john ham when he was 40 when he made it at least oh, right. and i mean and you think about those things and it's that is the best advice i'm seeing it now with some you know you you've seen it five times over with me with your students and people you've worked with and everything else there is nothing better than all of a sudden whether it's a tv show movie or something Somebody, and it doesn't have to be, you know, you're the biggest star in the world overnight, but somebody getting that nod going like, oh, they're here now. Like, they're really yeah. talented. And you're like, yeah. they, they've been really talented. Yeah. <laughs> they've been at the Groundlings. They've been, a, they've been on stage on Broadway or wherever else. You're just now being treated to them because it's been packaged to you on a higher level. But I don't yeah. know. I'm sure you share some of that joy with some of your colleagues or people you've just become familiar with. But I, uh, oh, there's yeah. no better feeling than seeing somebody break almost. Totally agree. And, and, you know, it is one of the things that I do tell my students is that you guys have to be each other's allies in this. Success for one of you is success for all of you. This is not a competition. This is, there is space for every single person who's graduating right now. You sure. just have to find the place that's yours. Um, and frankly, I, I mean, I, I've seen it even with my own career, you know, like you said, I'm having all these opportunities now. Yes, show running was a huge learning experience, Am I a vastly different writer than I was two years ago? I don't think so. I you, think, no way. There's no I way. I think the reason that the show happened, or one of the big reasons, was I did know what I was doing before this to an extent. Yeah. But, you know, then you get whatever that credit is that makes everybody go, oh, okay, well, now she's a showrunner and everything changes <laughs> to an extent. Okay, I'll take it. I, I appreciate that so much. And it's just, it's funny to watch... I, I don't know. I get a weird joy out of people that you've been telling, like, hey, you should listen to this band or go see this person yeah. perform or go see this play. Like, no, 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 it's good. Like, I'm not just going to tell you to go to something. And then, you know, five years goes by and 
and then they hit it and they're like, hey, these people are good. It's like, we've been yeah. telling you this. I told but, you. Yeah. yeah. Well, <laughs> well, it feels like maybe you're there and you're working your way towards even bigger stuff. So what a, what a great conversation. I, I really appreciate you stopping by. Thanks for having me. It was really nice to see a friendly face in the middle of all this. <laughs> yeah, we're trying. Uh, is there anywhere someone should go other than Apple TV? What uh, what else should we uh, support while we're uh, talking Did you be to you um, I would love to listen to The Horror of Dolores Roach on uh, Spotify. Okay. Let's make it happen. That's really easy, guys. Right. Uh, Dara, thank you so much for stopping by. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Nice to meet you.